Uh, good morning everyone and welcome to the 18th meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2017. Can I welcome everyone back from their recess? I'm sure fully refreshed and all got our new school bag and pencil case with us for the new term. Um, can I ask everyone in the room to uh, ensure their mobile phones are switched off uh, or switched to silent? Um, of course, you can use them for social media, but don't film or uh, record proceedings. Uh, the first item on our agenda is declaration of interest and in accordance with section 3 the Code of Conduct. Uh, I invite Brian Whittle to declare uh, any interest relevant to the remit of the committee. And can I remind members that any declaration should be brief but sufficiently detailed to make clear to any listener the nature of the interest. <laughs> Thank you, Kavira. Um I'm a director of a collaboration communication platform that includes healthcare as part of its, uh, its clientele. Um, I don't take any active part in that business anymore and don't take any remuneration from that business. I'm also a board member of the West of Scotland NSPCC. Um, and pertinent to this case, I'm a level four coach, former chair of the coaches, Scottish Coaches Association and a member of the European Coaches Association. Uh, thank you, Brian, and welcome to the committee. And I think it's only right that we put on the record there. Thanks to Donald Cameron for his work while he was a member of the committee. Um, agenda item two is subordinate legislation. Uh, we have one negative instrument to consider today, and that is the Carer Scotland Act 2016, prescribed days regulation 2017, SSI 2017-207. There's been no motion to annul, and the Delegate Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on the instrument. Uh, during our uh, predecessor committee scrutiny of the Carers Bill, concerns were raised by stakeholders regarding the estimated costs set out in the financial memorandum. Um, in response, the Scottish Government set up a financial-led group with stakeholders, including COSLA, carers organisations and others, to consider cost estimates. The Scottish Government's response to the Committee Stage 1 report stated that the Scottish Government would write to the Health and Sport and Finance Committee setting out the conclusions of the finance-led working group. Um, the members agree that we should write to the Scottish Government and ask for the findings of the finance-led group. Okay. Yep. Um, and the SSI requires local authorities to publish their eligibility criteria. Um, however, it's not clear if this will be before or after the funding to local authorities has been established. Um, if it's after funding has been allocated, there could be uh, concerns that rather than ensuring delivery of better and more consistent support for carers, the level of support provided carers could be driven by uh, the budget. Uh, does the committee agree the, uh, that we should uh, also write to the Scottish Government to establish the timings for the criteria and the budget setting aspects for eligibility and that the committee could also request information on the mechanism that will be used for distributing the funding? Is that agreed? Thank you. And does the committee agree to defer whether it wishes to make a recommendation on the SSI until we receive this further information from the Scottish Government? We don't have to make a decision uh, uh, until, after, until the 25th of September. Is that okay? Thank you. Agenda item three is child protection and sport. Um, we have two panels this morning. Can I welcome to the committee uh, Stuart Regan? Uh, Chief Executive of the Scottish Football Association, Andrew McKinley, Chief Operating Officer, Scottish Football Association, uh, John McCrimmon, Chairman of the SYFA, and Duncan Mays, Director of Finance, uh, Scottish Youth Football Association. Can I also uh, remind members, um, for the purposes of standing order rule and sub judice, no mention should be made of any live, ongoing cases during this evidence session or anything that might prejudice those cases. So we'll now move to uh, questions. Um, could I first of all just ask for some clarity around the uh, Chief Executive of the SYFA? Is it, are we, am I correct in saying that he has now stood down? Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, Claire. Thank you, Convener, and thank you, panel, for coming along to join us um, this morning. Um, I wonder if you could help the committee by um, describing uh, how someone applies for PVG through one of your organisations. So I present tomorrow morning to a soccer academy or a soccer youth group um, and want to volunteer. So what's what's the process? Can you talk me through that, please? Yeah, I'll talk you through that. Uh, process is that obviously the individual will present yourself to the club. The club will know the individual know who he's about and they'll do the original vet on it to make sure that they're happy with him presenting. We have made some changes which we've presented within our written uh, 
submissions. So at the moment, when the individual gets presented, the club then accept that they're going to bring them into their organisation to work with the kids. They will then, uh, from the 21st of August now this year, he'll, they'll apply for an application to join the SYFA. At that point, they won't be allowed to join the SYFA until they've presented themselves to a PVG night where they're allowed to fill in the PVG forum and start the process. Once the office receives that application forum, they will then grant them provisional membership. So that's a probationary membership which allows them to work with the club under supervision from other PVG holders. Once their PVG process is complete and we receive the return certificate, provided that's all in order, they'll be granted full membership. Prior to the 21st of August, we have a three month to allow them to get to the PVG night, but we've closed that on the 21st of August. Um, can you uh, explain to me then a bit more about what that is? That sounds very a very strategic overview. So actually, practically, what happens? Well, that practically, what, what happens is that the individual will be with the club. The club go online as a registered club and they go to register the official. From that, it's generated the uh, information they need to go to the league to present themselves for an additional signature to ensure they are who they are and everything is, is in order with the form. So they, they go along to another meeting? Yeah, they go to a meeting with an additional signatory. Now, it can happen in several different ways. They can go to a pre-organised meeting with their league. They can go to a, another club who has an additional signatory there, one of our additional signatories who can do it for them. Or if, if it's urgent and they need to be done quickly, one of the additional signatories can go and meet them at the club and deal with the forums. That then goes into the SYFA office, they're checked against the system, logged on, and then they're granted that probationary membership. Okay, and so who checks them onto the system at the SYFA? The SYFA office staff, yes. Okay, so that's the office staff, not volunteers, it's the office no, staff? No, office staff do that. Okay, yeah. and you, you spoke about PVG nights. Yes. Can you tell me what that is? Yeah, what 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 happens is the, the there'll be at certain parts of the year more than others, but clubs will have more than one new volunteer coming along. Mm -hmm. So you may have five, six, seven, eight or nine clubs all with new volunteers. The league organise a specific night for these volunteers to turn up with their uh, documentation, their identifications, and they are then begin the process of PVG. Okay, and and the, the you say the league. So who is the league? Who are these people who yeah. run these okay. PVG nights? The, the the league are volunteers who are members of the league committee, who who organise that particular league's events. So the, the the league competitions, and the cup competitions, they organise that. They they administrate the league. Right. So so they start that process with with the individual. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry, Marie. Yeah. A couple of supplementaries to um, Claire's line of questioning. Um, firstly, how often do you hold these PVG nights and do you hold them throughout the country? Yes, they're, they're held throughout the country. As part of our ongoing improvements, uh, we have met with the leagues and working along with the leagues to put in, we've requested to do one every month so that we can have an ongoing system of getting it done. We've also spoke with... Every month all That's what we've requested. Not all okay. leagues will do that because some are smaller than others. It depends on the size of the league. It okay. depends on the requirement. We're also in the process of, of setting up a, a group of additional signatories who can support leagues who maybe need a bit more help if they've got a backlog of the amount of people they've got to go and do. Mm -hmm. So if they've got, say, 20 to do and they can only do, what, say, 10 that night, then we can supply a additional signature to support them. OK. Would you be able to give us a little bit more detail on that? I represent the Highlands and Islands, and mm -hmm. I can see already the size, you know, that there might be a challenge for folk yeah. getting all over the country. So a little yeah. bit more information on just how often these things are happening and yeah. where people are based and 
how far they travel would be very helpful. Yeah, it, it very much as you say, depends geographically in the area. When you go into the Highlands and Islands, we would look to have individuals from the clubs sanctioned to be additional signatories right. to allow the clubs to do that part Themselves. so that we can verify that so the system can start to run. Okay, that's fine. The other question I had was, um, we had an email from a chap, Peter Glancy, who used to be the chair of the SYFA, and he mentioned that um, the SYFA look for a birth certificate yes. when confirming ID, which isn't a standard requirement. There's usually alternative types of ID that you can use for a PVG check. So why do you ask for something um, less than, you know, that, is, that isn't, that's different from the general PVG yeah. requirement and might be trickier for people to get their hands on? To be perfectly honest, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I wasn't part of the original set up on what the requirements was. I would need to take that back and look into it and see whether, where we actually decided that we needed that as against other, other organisations. Uh -huh. <coughs> that information when Certainly, you find it. yeah. Thank you. I'll get that for you. Uh, Jenny. Good morning to the panel. Just as a supplementary to my colleague Claire Hoy's point um, with regard to these PPG nights, um, I was previously a teacher before I was elected and I, I understand that um, some sort of child protection training would be involved in applying for the PVG scheme. Um, can I ask if any of the PVG nights then involve any level of child protection training? You would expect that from volunteers or is that something you work with the SFA with or with Disclosure Scotland? We're working on an ongoing basis, the training with uh, Disclosure Scotland and Volunteer Scotland and obviously with the SFA. Uh, the leagues do have training nights in regard of child welfare and there's additional signature training so that they, they understand exactly what their requirement is in respect of the additional signature. And can I ask, is that training compulsory? Yes, it's part of what we, what we set out. Yeah, it's not, it's not something that would be not done, if that makes sense. Yeah, OK, thank you. Different from it, is it? I mean, is it? Compulsory? It's not written as compulsory. So it's but, not compulsory. But, but it's part of going forward. It will be part of a directive that we're working along with the SFA on, which makes it compulsory. To answer well, them. <clears throat> yes. Maybe if we can add on that point, part of the directive that the Scottish FA put in place last October involves um, online education being taken uh, on a compulsory basis by all, all people that would go through the PVG scheme. And if they don't complete that? Then clearly the organisation is in breach and we would bring it to their attention and deal with it through our normal normal channels. The, the organisation being the team? Well, we would, we would in the first instance flag it to the Youth FA. The Youth oh. FA would then be responsible for taking it up with the relevant league and or club, depending where the, the fault lies. Forgive me, but they maybe haven't got the best of records in that regard. Well, so therefore, are you confident that they have got the capacity to do that? I'm absolutely confident. I mean, since we um, met here last time, uh, we've got a new leadership team that have come in place that are here this morning um, representing the board. Um, they've acted very uh, diligently, very conscientiously. They've put in place um, a series of new processes and procedures. They've also invested in resource, which was one of the points this committee raised at the last meeting. Um, so they have put additional resource in place, not, volun not voluntary resource. Um, and I'm very confident with the changes that have been made, their agreement to come on board with the Scottish FA's own IT system to actually have a single IT solution. I'm very confident that some of the challenges that were presented at the last committee meeting have now been addressed. Brian. Can I ask volunteers get to work with children in this process? Yeah. As of the 21st of August, they, they are not allowed to work with children until we have received the forums in that they're now in the PVG process. At that point, they become a provisional member, which allows them to work with the kids, provided they're working and supervised by a PVG holder. For the information for the, for the committee, from the 1st of April 2018, we'll be removing that provisional membership and it will become the situation that they will not be allowed to work with kids until such times as we have completed the PBC process on that individual. So, excuse me, if, they, um, if you see that system as being not satisfactory and you're going to change it, then you have to change it. Presumably you would want to change it now. 
what's stopping you from yeah. changing it now? We, we made the first change from going from having a, a three month uh, time lag to having from the 21st of August the situation where the individual now has to present itself. For us to get to where we, we want to be and we think it's the right place to be, we have to make sure we have the infrastructure in place to, to deliver that. That's why we are doing this in two stages. Stage one is to remove the three months, which we've carried out, and then in April, leading in for season 18-19, we'll then move directly to having the PVG forms back before we allow membership. Thank can, I, can I maybe just clarify for the, the members' understanding? Currently, they have a category within the Youth FA called provisional member. And a provisional member means you can work in a club environment with children, providing you're working with somebody who has already got a PVG um, uh, agreement in place. In the future, from the 21st of August, the provisional membership category will disappear completely. You're either approved or you're not approved. And if you're not approved, you're not allowed to work with children uh, in the club environment. So it's, it's black and white, and it's very clear, very simple. Can I ask, is it mandatory for clubs to have a child protection officer? Yes. Yeah, it is mandatory. Yes. So, you would, you, so the, there's no way that they could uh, circumvent these uh, rules, a club can circumvent these rules? When you say no way, you know, the rules are in place. We monitor you know, the clubs in respect of the PVGs, in respect of the child protection officer. So we're confident that we have the infrastructure in place at the moment to handle that particular situation. So we don't see that being something we would have a problem with. And, uh, just a supplementary to that, can I ask what level of coach, do you have to have a coaching qualification to, to work with the children? At, at the moment, the club required to have at least one 1 1.2 level coach. So, you, so therefore you can work with the kids without a coaching qualification? Yes, you can be a coaching assistant if you like. You can work with the coach, yeah. With the greatest respect, a coaching assistant is still a level of coach. Yeah. So what I'm saying to you is that they can they can work with the children with, without a coaching qualification? Well, they can work with the club, but the, but the club must have that overall 1.2 there to, to supervise that. But that, you know, from, from where we're at here today, that's not really relevant to this, is it? Oh, I think it is. In, in what respect? Part, because part of coach education is around child protection. That's correct. That's, that's part of what you do during yeah. coach education. So well, I'm, I'm only asking the question to see whether or not there's a direction of travel in which you're going and that would no, no. be close that No, yet. that's fine. I just needed to understand the, re the, relevance, the re relevance of it. And you're, you're correct that the coach education in respect of child welfare and child protection is, is paramount. Mm. You know, it's not, it's not tied to whether it's a 1.1 or a 1.2 coaching certificate it's part of what we're doing with the clubs part of what the directive we're working with the SFA and making sure that the clubs as uh, Stuart pointed out there part of the directive is that every one of our members so that's all 15,000 will be required to do at least an online child welfare training all the child protection officers will have to do the online training and a, a, a uh, two hour session in respect of child welfare okay. so it's part of that directive if that was where you were going with okay. it In relation to the dates Mr uh, Reagan said 21st of August the new system, I think you said no, April No, I, I just to, sorry Stuart, to correct you 21st of August 2017 we removed the three month allowance and went to you have to start the PVG process from the 1st of April 2018 okay. we will remove it completely uh, we would have liked to have done it right away, okay. but we need to have the infrastructure and everything in place to make it work. Um, Mr Whittle referred to uh, child protection officers. In um, the letter that we received, um, it mentions the SYFA Child and Wellbeing Protection Officer. Is this a new post? With, within our organisation? The, there is a child protection officer responsible for the, the running of it within the office. Uh, How long have they been there? That, that's always been there. Why have we never heard from them? Uh, I, I, can you answer that question? I, I why, don't know why. At, at this stage, given that we're dealing 
with child protection and well-being yeah. are we only finding out that you have such a person in your organisation from a letter you're submitting at this date? Well, I can only apologise if, if you feel they've, they've not contacted It's pretty you. fundamental to the issue. No, I can, I can only apologise. It's been dealt with through, through the, you know, obviously the organisation. Th their role within the, the office is they, they deal with the stuff as it comes in. OK. Um, Alison. Oh, yeah, Alison. Yeah, um, thank you, convener. Um, two of the organisations that might help you get to where you want to be and might provide at least you know, some infrastructure support, our Disclosure Scotland and Volunteer Scotland. And the Scottish Government, when they were responding to the committee's report, you know, they, they suggested they were anxious that the SYFA could fall behind again um, due to limited administrative ca capacity, but, but that Volunteer Scotland and Disclosure Scotland could provide that additional support. And um, the Government also state that they feel that progress is being made to improve the way the SYA, F, SYFA operates. And... I'd just like to understand what kind of support you're receiving from Volunteer Scotland and Disclosure Scotland. Yeah. We, we, we are very much engaged with both Volunteers, you know, Scotland, Disclosure Scotland and uh, VSDS as well in, in respect of what we're doing. Uh, we have, as, as Stuart again pointed out earlier, put in resource to make sure that we can deal with, with what we're doing. I, I, I do have, you know, some information in respect of where we are in, in, in the, the numbers, so to speak. Uh, we looked at where we've been from the last uh, committee meeting and from March to August we sent to uh, VSDS 6,181 applications for PVG and from March to August we've received back 6,171 certificates so we're working with them in respect of letting them know where we are, the numbers we're working with, what support we need, and it, it's been working well over the last few months. And again, you know, we, 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 we're looking forward to taking that forward. Um, thank you. The committee report um, suggested that funding should be conditional on adequate procedures and being in place and timorously adhered to, and the Scottish Government response states that its investment agreement with the SFA for 1718 will, and I'm quoting, include robust conditions related to safeguarding and the SFA will be held to account on these conditions. I just wondered what specific conditions have been included in any agreement. We've agreed um, a series of uh, objectives which come out of our directive that we've put in place with all members. So there's a series of, of stages that um, members have to go through, including areas like training, for example, completion of um, implementation of, of new guidelines and policies. They have to be in place for all members. And we've got a series of trigger dates. And we've agreed with uh, Sports Scotland and the Scottish Government that all of those dates will be adhered to and the funding will be conditional on that. We've signed up to that. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Mr. Convener, good morning to the panel. Um, obviously, since the, the committee published a report uh, in April, um, a BBC investigation on uh, in the 28th of June reported that between 2014 and 2016, Disclosure Scotland had informed the Scottish Youth Football Association that 116 of its members were under consideration for listing by Disclosure Scotland, but the association only had records of 69 such cases. And I'm sure you appreciate that it's very difficult for you to take action on cases like this if you simply don't appear to have the records to, 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 that, that match up with Disclosure Scotland. So can I ask the panel um, if you're satisfied that such a situation where the information is clearly completely different from that held by Disclosure Scotland cannot arise again as a result of the steps you've taken and can you outline for the committee exactly what steps you have taken to make sure this doesn't arise again? Uh, I can answer the, the question in respect of where, where it came from, where we are and where we're going. Uh, it, it came from the fact that our IT systems were inadequate in respect of answering the questions around that particular number. Uh, subsequent to, to that BBC report, we engaged with uh, Disclosure Scotland to check all of the 116 records. So although we couldn't extract easily the number, what we could do was interrogate the system for every single individual, which we carried out. We have working closely and 
big thanks to the SFA and respect to the IT, where we're integrating our system into the SFA system, which will allow us the reporting suites that we require to answer these questions going forward. So in the short term, we'll work closely with, with Disclosure Scotland on numbers and talk to them and make sure that we're, we're on track and we, we can keep that going. But the future's the ability to, to pull out this type of information on request. But you're satisfied that the procedures you've got in place in the interim basis means you can deal with all these individual yes. cases and you have yes. that information yes. in order to do that? Yeah. Yeah, we can we can extract the information and we can work with the schools of Scotland. We are happy with that. Okay. Okay. Um, can I ask? You say you were you interrogated closely the records. Um, is that of the one hundred and sixteen people who had been identified by the BBC, or is that of everyone? Is the one hundred and sixteen plus up to the date at that point? So the one hundred and sixteen was up to 2016, I believe. So we then checked, f along with the scores, right up until July 2017. So okay. each one of the 116 were double-checked, yes. OK. And there were three individuals who had been listed by Scottish mi ministers yes, correct. in that list. How long had they been working with children since they had been listed, each individual? I don't have that personal information on that. I can say that once they were identified via the systems they were removed. once they were identified via the bbc no 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 once they were identified by the schools of scotland so they were dealt with in the appropriate manner at the time it happened so there's no gap between when they were dealt with and the bbc report so so if an individual in that was listed in 2015 they would have been removed in 2015 so the so the the, the answer I'm, I'm giving you is that so how could there have been, out of those 116 people, how could there have been three people who were listed who were still on your books? No, 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 no. The three people were removed, as it says in the in, in, in written submission, the three people were removed from the association at the point that they were informed. So when the, so when the Disclosure Scotland let us know there's an issue, that individual will be precautionally suspended, and then if they're listed, they'll be removed. So they'll be removed immediately, we're told. I'm, I'm just a li uh, Forgive me, I'm, I'm no, not No, 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 keep pushing, because I can get, uh, yeah, I'll get the not, answers in a, in a fashion that I can maybe I don't think I'm it. quite understanding the system, and I'm and neither am I understanding. So if, if you have a, an absolutely watertight system for when Disclosure Scotland inform you that someone is being um, considered for listing, then how did you yeah. think you only had 69 people yeah. being considered yeah. for listing, and yet you it, had 116? It's a, it's a good question. <laughs> right. I'll explain two things. I'll explain how the system works in respect of when, when, when Disclosure Scotland lets us know that there's somebody considered for listing. They will, they will inform us. We'll go into our system. And so we did they inform you about 116 people? Yes. Yes. We checked all that information. And out of the, there, there was the three that were, that were eventually listed. When they inform us that somebody's been considered for listing, we then immediately progressively suspend them because they're being considered. We then have to wait to wait the outcome of that consideration, which may be listed or not listed. If they're listed, we'll remove them there and then. But they've been taken out from the minute we were told about the consideration. The problem with our previous IT system is that when you change the status of an individual, it overwrites it. So it was being able to interrogate the historic information. So if you say, well, how many people are listed between that day and that day? It's, okay. it's difficult for us to go into the system and get it. However, going forward, as we work closer with the SFA, we'll be able to answer the questions when we need to. Is that, if it's in simple terms, and hope that I understand it, that your internal systems for removing people who were identified were, were working? Yes. But your communication system between Disclosure Scotland in terms of information technology was not working? Our, I don't know if it's between Disclosure... Or however... We, we, our, our ability to go back and pull out from a particular time scale, a time date, and say how many people are listed, say, in that month, or considered for listed in that month, 
we we can't get that. Right. Can I, can and that I, would be cons I? that would be consistent from what I understand the BBC found out because they went back several times and said to the SYFA, "Are you sure about these numbers?" To which your reply, your organisation said yes, and they said, "Well, they are yeah. correct according to their FOI information." Mm -hmm. Is that how you see it? I see it that that exactly as you said. Uh, so that, yes that, is the answer. Yeah, that we we could not get that information correctly. We gave the BBC the information that we had and we believed was was correct. Okay. However, it, it's it's turned out that it's not. Miles. Um, thank you. I wanted to pursue this IT question because if you've admitted that your IT systems have not been up to scratch but you're handing this down to member organisations, what assurances do you have that they are not going to, in a year's time, actually be in the same situation you've been in? And what investment are they putting into their IT systems, which you know about? The, the IT system covers all of our members. It, it doesn't cascade. It covers the members. Uh, to give you the, the, the sort of time, you know, the, 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 the linear sections of it. Beginning of the season, the league registers. So that becomes a league. The clubs then register to the league. The officials then register to the club. Going forward, all of that information, and along with the appropriate reporting suites, will be sitting on the SFA system. So not only will we get the report suites, but we'll also be working closer with the SFA, and the SFA will get the report suites, so, so they'll know exactly what the numbers are at the same time as we do. So for parents and guardians, you think you can now say this is completely watertight then? I say that when we get there... In a that, year's right, time. Yeah. When we get there, yes, once we've got all that in place, we will be there. In the short term, we have to migrate the stuff over and get the right reporting suites in, and then we're able to look at historic information. Can I just add to that? Because, you know, when you use phrases like watertight, it implies that there's actually a safety issue as far as a child is concerned. What John's describing is improving the process and the visibility of information. You know, when he said they, ha they cannot pull off historical reports, that was why they couldn't <coughs> identify the gap between the 69 and the 116, which, um, which um, uh, Ms. Todd was referring to uh, earlier on, they'd taken action with the individuals at the point they were notified, but they couldn't produce the historical data to back that up. So what we, they will now have is a situation where they'll be migrating to the Scottish FA. Our system, which has been available for all of our members now for, uh, for many years, um, and which the Youth FA were the only asso affiliated association that didn't come on board, that will now provide historical reporting and give ac access to the data that, that we're all talking about. And from the information you've submitted to committee, do you think this is more or less bureaucratic now? Um, I think I wouldn't use the phrase bureaucratic. What I would say is it's a robust process and it's a system which is actually used in all other parts of our non-professional game, which gives visibility and transparency um, and identifies when the PVG scheme has been completed. Um, so I, I would say robust rather than bureaucratic. Okay, thank you. Now, do you accept now that you have much, a much more important role in oversight and scrutiny? Uh, I think the, um, the panel's um, uh, position on this has uh, encouraged us to have a look at the, the distance between the Scottish FA and the Scottish Youth FA, and where there was a gap was working more closely together. I think I would still say that the affiliated associations um, have devolved responsibility to run youth football. They are responsible for making things happen. Where we have um, come closer together is in terms of making sure we provide the support to allow them to do the job. So uh, governance, IT, support, resource, um, finance. So we are actually providing much, a, a much closer working relationship that wasn't there previously under the, the last regime. I understood the latter part of your statement there, but I didn't quite understand the former part. But I accept that you are more involved. Would it be fair to say you're more involved? We are more involved now and working much more closely with the youth FA. Okay, thank you. Ivan? Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, panel. Just um, for the record, and to clarify some of the, the terminology, um, you're talking about listing and consideration for listing. Um, 
just like to understand what exactly those mean and what process part of the process that becomes apparent. So my understanding was that the PVG process, you made the application, Disclosure Scotland would then check against a list that they have and come back and say, yeah, here's your certificate or no, we're not giving you a certificate. Um, is that what you mean by listen or is listen something that happens later when their yeah. database changes or it, some it, other information it, it becomes happen, apparent? It can happen two ways. Right. Uh, at the point of an application and disclosure may send the information back that that individual is being considered for listing. So that may come back with the PVG. Okay. So that's when they're applying, right? So that's what's an, a new individual who's coming into your organization and disclosure's got to tell you that individual is getting considered for listing. So that's, that's one. The second one is when you have an uh, individual who is in your organisation, who, through other information, which, you, with due respect, disclosure will explain, they will then inform you that that individual is being considered. So, on the one hand, you have a new applicant who you can see is being considered, and the other is an applicant, uh, somebody who's already a member, who you're informed is being considered. The process is the same for both. The precaution is suspended until such times as disclosure come back with either they're being listed or they're not being listed. If they're listed, straightforward membership is not granted or removed if it's an existing member. Okay. So again, just to be clear then, so the 116 number we're talking about, that was over a period of time um, and you're obviously putting through thousands, if not tens of thousands. So is that the total number that were rejected, if you like? No, no, the... to, to uh, Miss Todd's, uh -huh. the three were rejected. No, uh, sorry, to, to all of the thousands or tens of thousands that went through, the 116 was the number that were considered for yes, listing in yes, total. Yes, so that was the number, and, so the, and that was, I think, I believe from 2014. Right, so the vast, vast majority, the percentages, yeah. but it's 100 odd out of tens yeah, of thousands. Yeah, it's, right. it's sort of a, um, a large okay. number. And then, then out of that number, there was only three that were actually... Listed. Listed. So again, the vast majority of the ones that were considered for listing weren't listed as such. Okay. 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 That's clear. Thanks. Uh, clear. Uh, uh, thank you, Can I ask if any members of the panel have uh, completed child protection training? <coughs> I have. No. I've not yet. No. Uh, do you have any plans to do so? Yes. As part of discussions we're having with the SFA and make sure that we're all in line with the directive. And can I ask how, how long uh, both Mr McCrimmon and Mr Mays have been members of the SYFA? Yeah. Uh, I've been a member of the SYFA since 1990, or since the inception of 1999. So member of youth football in the SYFA when it came in, in press in 1999. Uh, 1999. Yeah. Okay. I have been on previous child protection courses with children first, but in the context of where we are now, I'd like to say that you know we want to go through the new processes. Okay, so you 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 have completed some child protection yeah, yes. training, but not the current child not protection the current, training. No. And Mr. Mees? Yeah, I've done nothing. No. You've done no child protection training no. whatsoever. Although I'm a, a I have been passed for PVG. Yeah, that wasn't what I was asking. No, I know. It was about child protection training. Yes. Okay, and that's something that you are planning on doing. Um, I plan to do that, yeah. I'm not active in uh, football. I purely deal with the finance, although there will be games uh, which I attend where I uh, obviously children are about, so I've got I've got uh, a PVG chain. But do you accept that as a senior member of the SYFA you have a responsibility to be uh, aware of child yeah. protection issues? Yeah, I think we should be setting an example, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I want to turn to Mr Regan and it's about an issue that I'd raised with you the last time you were here at committee and which was um, in the, the committee's report uh, where I had asked um, about issues that were raised by the then Children and Young Persons Commissioner about his concerns about uh, the overall culture in uh, professional football regarding children and uh, his, his words at the time about control over children and I had asked you about um, the power imbalance within the relationship between clubs and children. Um, now, as I see from, um, fr well, from the report, we'd said that we um, didn't accept that it wasn't credible, that there was no power imbalance. However, you've reiterated that in your 
letter to the committee today. Um, I wonder if you could perhaps explain why you still take that stance? I think it's the context in which the comments were made. In the letter that we received from the then Children's Commissioner, um, he suggested that an imbalance could allow opportunities for sexual abuse to take place, but that which wasn't we, the we, we refuted that. The committee. Sorry to interrupt you there, because I'd asked you about what he'd said at a previous committee meeting, not about a letter that had been sent to yourself. And I was quite specific about that. Well, I couldn't recall what was said at the previous committee meeting when you m made reference to the term power imbalance. Mm -hmm. The, the term power imbalance was used in a letter we had received from the Children's Com Commissioner in the context of pr providing a vacuum where sexual abuse could take place. We thought that was significantly overstated and reiterated that we didn't believe such a, a power imbalance would allow sexual abuse to take place. That was the point I was, I was making in the last committee meeting. If I've answered... Um, if I've answered or if I've given you the impression I was talking about a different question, I'm happy to take any specific question about what you meant by power imbalance and I'm happy to take that now. Absolutely. Well, perhaps I could repeat the question that I asked you at the committee when I clarified that at that meeting, um, which was where I'd said to you, sorry, but that's not the issue um, that the Children's Commissioner was alluding to. It certainly was not the inference that I took from the information that he gave us at the hearing. Um, so I was quite specific that it was about at this committee. Um, rather, it was about a power imbalance between clubs and children because of contracts that children were signing and the conditions attached to those that were imposed on children and young people. Um, it wasn't about sexual or physical abuse, and I'm quoting here from that. It's about power imbalance, when it's, which in itself can be abusive. Um, do you accept that? Well, I don't, I don't accept that there is a significant power imbalance in such a way that the, the children are somehow disadvantaged or in a, put in a, a difficult place. It's very clear at the outset, at the beginning of the registration process, exactly what happens as far as um, that child is concerned. Parents are involved. There's a very clear process in place. And um, children are free to go back to play amateur football on a 28-day period if they're not uh, playing for their for their team. But you, you, you told me at that point in time, and I raised that, that 28 days is not they are free. Is not they? It's not that you're free to. They have, they have a, a contractual obligation. They are able to go back and play. They're free to go back if they're not playing for their team. So if, if the issue is about opportunity and if the issue is about not getting chances to play, then they're able to go back and play recreational football. If they wish to, to move to another professional academy, then there is a process in place which is very similar to every other country across Europe where compensation is paid between clubs for the training that has been provided in the formative years of that child's development. That's a mechanic to compensate clubs for giving free, free coaching and free training to potential footballers which if they weren't with a professional club, they would typically pay for in the youth or community sector. So it's a compensation mechanism, not a contract. Can I say there, Mr Regan, that what you're talking about is children as a commodity? No, I disagree. I think what we're talking about is a pathway to develop elite players, which works in, in every other country across Europe, where there is a process in place to ensure that clubs who are investing a lot of time, energy and resource in developing elite players, and we have a duty of care to develop elite players as well if we want to be successful on the international stage, um, we, we have that process in place and a suitable compensation mechanism for the clubs. It's very clear, it's very transparent, parents are aware of it, the clubs themselves have all signed up to it, and you know, that, that's the mechanism that we've been talking to the Children's Commissioner about for a number of years, and there's a misunderstanding between registration and contract. It's not a contract, it's a registration scheme, and it, there's a compensation mechanism for any player that moves between academies and there is a release clause which we've put in place having had discussions with the public petitions committee and obviously you raised the point at the last meeting that 28 day release clause has been put in as a way of actually giving children further opportunities to go and play football if they feel they've been frozen out and with all of that all of you said all that you have said today you still don't accept that there is a power imbalance between a professional club 
and a child? No, there's a process in place. I think what you're trying to... I'm not asking about process. I'm asking about a power imbalance. And but, power but, imbalances can then lead to abuse. Not, I'm, I'm not alluding to sexual abuse or physical abuse, but, I'm, uh, uh, but you know, abuse of a child or potential abuse but of a child. By using phrases like power imbalance, you're implying that this, the clubs are somehow being um, abusing... That, that position that they find them, themselves no, in. No, what, no, well, I'm, you've I'm, used the I'm word not, abuse. You've uh, used yeah, the word abuse. I said abuse. I wasn't alleging, alleging that. What I'm saying is, do you not accept that there is a power imbalance between a large professional football club and a child? No, I don't accept that. I believe that there's a process in place. I understand place. there's a disagreement here. Yeah. That's, that's absolutely on the record. Uh, Brian. Um, from a coaching perspective, you know, and, and, and further to that, obviously when, it, when a when a child starts to work with a coach, there is an imbalance. There has to be an imbalance. There has to be a, it's a different a different form of relationship. I think that w what concerns me is that um, uh, in most coaching child relationships, there is a, 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 a mechanism, an easy mechanism, where that child, if not happy with the situation, can move on to another coach and can leave. My concern is as soon as a contract becomes into consideration, that becomes a much bigger imbalance than would not would naturally be expected within a coach athlete relationship. And I would, and I would just reiterate: Do you not accept that, that by contracting or signing some sort of registration form, that becomes a, a much bigger imbalance? Is that not something you can accept? I'm not. I'm not alleging anything at all. I, what I I'm accept saying is that leaves itself open to to certain kinds of. I issues. accept that there's a relationship where the club have the ability to make decisions for the benefit of the club. And what they're doing is they are considering all of the training that they've provided to that player during the pathway, and they're considering during a three-year period whether to offer that player a professional contract. All of that is outlined at the beginning of the process, and if a player is not offered a contract, he's, he's actually released. Um, but you know wh what, what I don't accept is that there is somehow um, a position where the club is is abusing that situation or somehow, um, uh, I don't know, bull bullying the, the, the child or putting the child in a difficult position. It's a very transparent process. You, you actually, you've, you've kind of answered my question uh, in a roundabout fashion because in your answer, at no point did you say benefit of the child. I think that's, that's where I'm always going to have an issue here in that in any sport, looking after your youth, and making sure the youth are, 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 are benefited to the, the extreme, and to any sports benefit, that's the start and finish. And, and I've got to say, Mr. Megan, we've had this discussion before. Again, you never mentioned the, the, the welfare of the child in any of your answers. There. But with, with, with respect, the benefit of the child comes if that child is, is um, offered a contract at the end of it. So the, 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 the ultimate benefit is a job in football, a, prof a, a job as a professional footballer no, in the not. academy. No, it's not. I'm sorry. The benefit, the benefit of the child, the benefit of the child, is to have a positive experience playing football. I mean, if I ask you the question, what percentage of players, youth players in your academies at the moment, get a full-time contract? A very small percentage. I think we, we, we all know that. We all know that there are very few jobs in football, but the clubs, as we pointed out in our response, the clubs do a huge amount for players. They have wellbeing programmes, lifestyle education, academic inf uh, education, football education, child protection, parents' nights. They, there are a huge amount of benefits to the player. And if you were to visit as a committee any of our performance schools or any of our academies, and we've made that offer to you previously, you will see the fantastic work that goes on. As far as the ultimate benefit of coming through an elite training programme, the ultimate benefit is being awarded a job at the end of it, being awarded a contract. If you don't get that contract, then many kids go and find um, careers elsewhere using some of the education that they've, they've had. Many go back to playing grassroots football. And, you know, ultimately, that's a positive thing as well. I think aside, many are cast aside, heartbroken and yeah. left without that support as well. And I've seen it in my own community and amongst my own group of friends. But I think, they, I think what's taking the temperature off the committee, what is, uh, I think, uh, causing concern is, a, is the failure to recognise that football players 
are a huge valuable commodity, and that is the priority for teams who are bringing people through. Um, I think not to recognise that and the financial worth of an individual who goes through that process and becomes very successful is something that I think everyone's finding frustrating. When you use phrases like commodity, you're, you're implying that that is, that is the, the be-all and end-all as far as the process is concerned. You know, what, what we do within Scottish football, what we do with our clubs, is put a process in place to develop a pathway to develop elite players. That, that pathway is an investment on behalf of the club, and that's why when there is a registration scheme at the age of 15 uh, years old to 17, which is one of the points that's been raised in the Public Petitions Committee, what the club are, are looking for is a period where they can make a decision on that investment. And if a, if a player isn't playing regular football and wishes to exit that process, he has an opportunity to do that within 28 days. If he wants to move to another academy, then as long as there is a compensation mechanism put in, uh, fulfilled, then that can also happen. So com commodity feels like you're trying to imply that there is, uh, it's simply about the financial value. You've used terms investment. You've used terms like um, compensation. Investment These are terms in the that child. That normally apply to financial transactions. In investment in the child can be time, it can be uh, resource, it can be education. It doesn't just have to be financial investment. But if you're going to provide a free coach for many years, or coaches for many years, that is an investment. That's an investment that clubs put in that you wouldn't get in the youth sector where many children pay a monthly fee to be coached in the, in, in the youth sector. Okay. Okay. Uh, Jenny. You can be there. Just as a kind of follow up to that, um, on page six of your submission uh, from the SFA, Mr. Regan, um, with regard to this power imbalance, um, you alluded there to training in terms of well-being, lifestyle education, academic education, you know, the idea that taking part in sport can impact upon a child's academic performance. And certainly that's been my experience as a teacher previously. Um, but all of those things focus upon the child and they don't focus upon necessarily the behaviour of, of a coach. Um, so I wonder, therefore, in terms of what we've discussed today, um, has the FF, SFA had any discussions with the SYFA and Disclosure Scotland about putting together some sort of child protection training package where you all work together and you deliver it to all coaches? Because there seems to be a pretty systemic lack of understanding about GERFIC, about child wellbeing, uh, you know, about protecting children in terms of sport. Would you agree that's something that needs to be looked at? Out coach, coach education for a second from the, the PVG process that we were talking about. As, as part of the Scottish FA's coach education programme, child, child protection is a part of that. And in addition, we've also gone through um, a programme with Positive Coaching Scotland, which is part of the Winning Scotland Foundation. It's a programme that they run. That's now embedded into all of our coaching programmes. The Youth FA have run the Positive Coaching Scotland programme. And what we're trying to do is to focus not just on um, child protection, which is clearly important, but also on behaviour and attitude as well. And that, that is, that is a, an intrinsic part of the programme that's in place. Do you accept, though, that the PVG application process isn't just about filling in a form? Because Mr McCrimmon, at the start of today's committee session, talked about PVG nights, which, to all intents and purposes, sounded like people sitting in a room and being taught how to fill in a form. Actually, PVG is about so much more than that. It's about child protection, and it is about getting it right for every child. The two go hand in hand. And, and you're absolutely right, but the process has to start with an application and it has to start with somebody filling in an appropriate form with an appropriate signatory and getting themselves into the system. Once that's, that's um, approved, there is then online education, online training, which we've put in place with the youth FA that every, everybody has to do, and that's mandatory in order to comply with, it, with the directive that we've, uh, we've agreed. Okay. Can, I, can, I just, sorry, sorry. Can, I, can I just add to that, just one specific, it's, it's further down page seven in our evidence, um, where we say that in, in September 2016, we appointed a children's rights and wellbeing officer over and above our manager to assist in advancing the developments of education for coaches and referees, which is the point you're making, and then making children's rights and wellbeing essential elements for people coming into those roles. So we do see that as a very, very important thing. And does that uh, officer work with your clubs directly? That, that, that person works within the Scottish FA, so works with our members, which includes our, which is our clubs and would be people like the SYFA to help them to embed within their membership. 
And do you measure how that's embedded or how do you gather that information in terms of is that person actually having an impact? That's on that's ongoing. I mean that was September two thousand and sixteen, so okay. it's, it's but it's 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 a it's a good step forward I would suggest. Good morning, panel. Uh, it's just pertaining to uh, the issue of football um, agents um, in Section 6 of both submissions, um, particularly to any legislative impediments to the PV check, PVG checking of agents. Now, the SFA response is that it is fully supportive of any change to the appropriate legislation which would bring intermediaries, agents, within the scope of the PVG legislation. The SYFA response is... The SYFA notes the content and has no further comment. Would the SYFA like to clarify what their position is? Well, the, the SYFA don't deal with agents in respect, you know, as, as an association, we don't have any interaction with agents. Or any at all? And we, we don't have anything in respect of that through the association that works within that type of remit. So that's why we've, we've just said we note the comments. It's not, it's not something we felt that we would, you know, be able to answer anything on. Okay, just a point of clarification. Thank you. Um, anecdotally, we have had, I personally have had, and I know the committee members will have as well, communication from um, former officials within the youth football who have raised concerns about issues around child protection, PVG, or other issues within the running and governance of the SYFA. They have then been subject to disciplinary procedures themselves for making those complaints. What do you have to say about that? Um, I'll speak uh, on this and then um, I'm sure Mr McCrimmond will add to it. Um, the two individuals that you refer to no, no. have had, no, no. Um, well, okay, um, the ind th we, are aware, we are aware of two individuals who have come to the Scottish FA and raised concerns about the way that their, their membership of the Youth FA was handled and the way that their club was handled within the league it plays within. Um, both myself and Andrew McKinley have met the individuals. We have then brokered meetings with the with Youth two FA. Individuals. Yeah. Um, we have met, we've met with those individuals and the Youth FA and we've put in place a series of, of constructive steps to try and address those concerns and we are confident that those challenges will be dealt with in the coming weeks. So if, a, if, if someone contacts us who finds themselves in that position, what is the procedure for them to try and address that issue? Well, the, the individuals would clearly in the first instance go to the Youth FA and it's fair to say that Mr McCrimmond and his new board have been very proactive in addressing any concerns that have been raised from the previous regime. Um, we're aware of where they've done that on several occasions and we're aware of two outstanding issues and there is a meeting planned next week to try and deal with those. Okay, that's helpful. So if we have further communication with any of those individuals, we will refer them to yourself, Mr Regan, in the first instance, or Mr McCrum? For them to be referred okay. to myself, and we'll put them in touch with the relevant people at the Youth FA. Okay, thanks. In re relation to the um, um, SFA's uh, review uh, that's underway, um, any recommendations that come forward? Um, how will those be implemented? You know, how will, it, will there be a negotiation between the SFA and the SYFA about are you accepting all the recommendations? How will it be overseen? Who will ensure that things are implemented? Can I just check it? some of its terminology? We've obviously got the, the independent review with Martin Henry, which won't report till the beginning of next year. We've got the independent inquiry that Children First have carried out, which we refer to in here in the interim report we've, we've had from that. Is it, is it the latter? Well, I think both anything oh, that reflects, anything that impacts on well, with the issues okay. that we're discussing today, oh. and there's recommendations go forward either to the SFA or the SYFA, well, the specific who's one, overseeing the implementation and the acceptance of all those recommendations? The specific one we have at the moment, which is the one from Children's First, we've shared the interim report with the SYFA and they fully accept that. Um, we are now All of it? Yes. Yeah. And is the, is the interim report still uh, not in the public domain? That, that's correct. Will it become in the public yes, domain? Yes, it will. Once we get the final report, we, we, we asked if we could put it in the public domain and we were asked if we would wait till the final report was done, which we accepted. It will absolutely be in the public domain. You were uh, asked by who? 
Not well, we to are, put it in the public domain. Well, we asked stage. children. We asked children first if we could. It's their report. If we could if, if, about the interim report, and, we, and understandably they said they would prefer if we waited until the, the final report. And, and I think we mentioned here that the final report we're happy to make available to the committee. We will work with the SYFA to go through it recommendation by recommendation and to check that every one of those is done. In fact, it's, it's our intention at the end to ask children first to go back in and to double check that that has happened. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, in, in relation to the governance review that's ongoing at the moment. Um, when you say governance review, are you referring to the Martin Henry yeah. Historical Child Sex yeah. Abuse that? Review? That is um, currently underway. Uh, we are getting monthly progress reports. We're expecting the, uh, the chair to provide us with a final report early in 2018. And again, we're more than happy to share the content of that report. Okay. Okay, thank you very much thank for you. your evidence this morning. I, I think on some issues we found it much more productive than previous sessions. On other issues, I'm sure the committee will have concerns, but thank you very much for your evidence this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Could I suspend briefly?
Can I uh, welcome to the committee uh, Lorna Gibbs, Chief Executive of Disclosure Scotland, and uh, Gerard Hart, uh, Director of Protection Services and Policy <laughs> Disclosure Scotland. Um, you're welcome this morning. Um, just move to questions, Colin. Convener, and, and good morning to, to, to the panel. Uh, can I begin by following up on a, a question um, I asked the previous panel, which was in relation to the, the, the BBC investigation, which reported in June, uh, and that investigation reported that there was a big discrepancy between the records held by yourselves, Disclosure Scotland, and the records that the SYFA held in relation to notifications that a, a person was under consideration for a listing. Could I ask whether the discrepancy um, has now been resolved uh, and you're satisfied that the, the information held uh, by uh, the SYFA is, is correct and, and whether the discrepancy is in relation to, to record keeping or whether there was any indication at all that action hadn't been taken at the time? Happy to do that. Um, when the discrepancy came to light, we had uh, an immediate meeting with colleagues from um, SYFA where we talked through the approaches that they had taken and what they were doing. One of my colleagues then went and spent quite a considerable amount of time in SYFA's office comparing our list to their list and checking to make sure that they could identify the 116 um, people who we had given them notification of. So I'm confident that um, the figure that we have is our, our 116 is correct, and I'm confident that they have now been able to identify all of the people within their system. So yes, I'm confident that we are now in a position where the figures are accurate. In terms of going forward, are you satisfied that any changes that have taken place within the SYFA means that we won't have a repeat of, of that type of discrepancy in the future? My understanding of where they are is that they're on a journey with their, their IT system, and that certainly seemed to be what had been causing the problems. I mean, their IT system is for them to implement, but they have proactively invited some of my colleagues in the customer engagement team to come and see how they plan to operate the new system and to talk through their new guidance and make sure that we're content. So at the moment, they are on a journey to a better place, um, and we will continue to have conversations with them to make sure that we're giving them the help and support they can to make sure that their figures are in a better position. Just on the issue of, of help and support, is there many other sporting bodies and organisations that get that same level of support that you're providing to the SYFA, or are they having to have additional support? And, and just on the issue of your own compliance checks, mm -hmm. um, when you carry out compliance checks, is one of those checks to ensure that an organisation has records of notifications from Disclosure Scotland that a person is under consideration for listing? We offer advice and support to a number of organisations. Certainly the bulk of our time in recent months has been SYFA, but we have also been providing support and advice to bodies like the um, Scottish Rugby Union. We provide regular briefing sessions and help sessions for um, regulatory bodies, bodies who are doing counter-signatories. So we have a whole series of events where people will come together. We'll get um, advice from my team on how the process works, um, particularly on what their responsibilities are. So that's a programme that's been going on for some time. The compliance visits will look at a range of things, um, including whether or not the organisation is understanding and aware of its full responsibilities and how those are being implemented. So we provide help to as many organisations as we can. Obviously, as any other government organisation, there are constraints in our capacity. But um, SYFA have taken the bulk of our activity, but we are making sure that we're carrying on with that broader range of support um, to other organisations that might also require the help. And just one, one final point. In the support that you provide to different organisations, are there any particular themes, particular concerns that are standing out that should be tackled as part of the whole review of the, the PVG system? Do you want to? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, just for some information, um, over the last uh, 18 months, we visited 323 different registered bodies and given them information about the PVG scheme and how it operates. And we've um, carried out 46 workshops, all with organisations that deal with children and young people. Um, one of the themes that comes out of these is the degree of awareness in the public and in organisations about how the barring system works and how the PVG scheme works generally. So there is a need to raise public and organisational awareness of PVG. What does it stand for? You know, is it about a simple check or is it about much more than that, which we believe it is? It's about an ongoing relationship between a person and, you know, the organisation they work for, 
and Disclosure Scotland to monitor and check that person over time. So we want to really think, th think through those issues in the PVG review and make sure that when we emerge from that review, what's left is a scheme which actually is much more publicly synonymous with safeguarding over a longitudinal um, type of idea rather than just a bit of paper you get when you apply for a disclosure. In relation to the organisations you deal how many organisations do you deal with? Thousands. Is there a figure, though? Is it, is it, is it 2,000, 10,000, 50,000? It's less than 10,000. Um, over the last... Um, over the last, as I say, over the last 18 months, we've, we've visited 323 different registered bodies. Um, however, there are fewer bodies than there are individuals who apply for disclosures. These umbrella bodies or, or clubs are, are, are probably less than a thousand of them in total, but there are many, many tens of thousands of different customers that we have. I'm sorry to have those numbers so immediately to hand. You maybe provide us with that. Yes. Um, in relation to those organisations, is the SYFA one of the largest by volume? Yeah? Yeah. In terms of sports Is it the clubs? largest by volume? I think it is actually the largest sports sports club by volume. In your view, is it credible for that organisation, the largest by volume in Scotland, to be running such a weighty uh, system on the back of volunteers and goodwill? Um, I think we're increasingly working with them to get them to understand what their responsibilities are, no, and we've no, certainly no, made no, a lot of progress. Not what I asked you. <laughs> Is it credible for them to run such a weighty system on the basis of volunteers and goodwill, in your opinion? And you're allowed to give your opinion. I'm a civil servant, I'm not sure I'm comfortable giving my opinion. <laughs> Um, I think there needs to be checks and balances. I mean, um, the, the ministers, when they were here during your previous session, um, were talking very much about the, the value that we place on volunteers. And certainly there is nothing that we'd, we, wa we would want to do that would restrict the ability of people to go out there and help out in their local communities. I think there's always going to need to be a balance between the people who want to volunteer for a short period of time where their child is a particular age and having a structure that sits alongside that that makes sure that people have a sense of the wider responsibility. So I think there always needs to be checks and balances and a mix of um, people who are there to volunteer and people who are there for a more sustained period of time and therefore are um, more in-depth training around what the individual responsibilities are. So the, the, the SYFA will, by volume, send more disclosure checks to you than, say, Glasgow City Council? I would need to double check the numbers. I don't have the numbers to hand. I mean, certainly in terms of sporting bodies, they would be the largest. Whether they're the largest single um, entity across what, um, what Disclosure Scotland do, I'm not sure, but we can certainly find out the biggest customers. Large public sector organisations you know, are, are the majority of the, of the PVG scheme, teachers, social workers, nurses, uh, and the like. Um, the sector within which the um, SYFA work is, the, is the, what we would kind of refer to as the free check area, you know, where people who are volunteering to do work with children receive a fee waiver for those checks. And they are a large volume part of that segment. But the PVG scheme is 1.1 million strong. You know, and there are obviously thousands of coaches in youth football, but they're only a drop in the ocean compared to the large number of people who are in the PVG scheme. I mean, I think the, the issue around um, safeguarding within that kind of volunteer context is one where, you know, I think the interfaces between the, the club and, 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 you know, the outside agencies who are responsible for child protection have to be really well developed. So good child protection training, good adherence to GERFEC and the ideas around child development, good interface with us in terms of that, that whole checking and barring part of it. I think it's feasible to have a, a large volunteer organisation when you have those really you know, carefully designed interfaces that allow statutory systems to step in whenever there's a problem and, and for problems to become you know, apparent when they start to develop much more readily than perhaps was the case at the end of 2016 when the backlog uh, became you know, apparent. So I think there is a, there is a rationale behind it, um, but, but obviously the safeguards have to be also in place. Brian? I think it's, I mean, it's fair to say that uh, the vast majority of coaches are volunteers. 
uh, and, and the system would obviously collapse without that. Um, I, if I could just very briefly go through my, my, my own recent experience, having taken on uh, a young 16-year-old T20 um, Paralympic athlete, um, within about three seconds of taking him on, I can see that the child protection officer arrived in front of me and said, I want to see your licence, I want to see your PBG check. Now, that's the way, for me, that's good practice. That's the way, that's the way it should happen. It's fairly obvious that's not happening within football. And my, concern, my, my, my question to you is that, do you feel there's a cultural issue here that's getting in the way uh, of child protection and that the, the, the governing bodies are more, um, more involved with protecting the rights of the clubs than protecting the rights of the children? <laughs> I think you're, you're taking us into, into areas that are really out with the um, remit and responsibility of Disclosure Scotland. So we have a particular remit and responsibility in relation to the um, PVG scheme and how it operates. I think when you start getting into some of the issues around power imbalances and how coaches work, it's just not something that I would be comfortable answering because I think it's just too far away from what we do. But surely you would, you would accept that within the, the, the investigation that the, this, this committee has done and other committees have done uh, around this are suggesting that uh, there are many, many coaches historically uh, in the last few years have come to light that uh, are not PVG checked. Um, would that not indicate? And, that, and that's not the same across the vast majority of sports. So football at, the, at worst is playing catch up with a lot of other sports. And I'm just asking if there's a cultural mm -hmm. issue we need to deal with here. I, I think that... that the, the issues that were that were identified um, around the backlog with the SYFE were, were were not so much that the SYFE hadn't thought that it was right that these people should be checked because they clearly had a policy that they should be checked. The issue was that they weren't processing and sending the checks through with the required speed to make sure that, that the safeguarding uh, outcomes of the scheme were being upheld. Uh, so it was an administrative inefficiency insofar as the backlog was concerned. So I think that's a, a different question to whether or not you know there's an appetite to do checking per se, because I think there is an appetite to do checking within the SYFA, and hopefully that that will continue, and 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 be strengthened. And um, so I don't know if that helps, um, but I think as well, Disclosure Scotland works with a whole range of different organisations within government around the, the GERFREC agenda, around the government's purpose. So we very much see ourselves as part of a, a constellation of services around young people uh, trying to strive for those um, those inclusive outcomes um, of which safeguarding and protection uh, is a very important part. So we don't see ourselves in isolation um, from these protective systems. Um, and I think that, for example, we're involved in a whole range of different policy areas across government that are about child welfare and, and development. But as far as you know, the particular matter of the SYFA checking people uh, is concerned, our understanding is that that wasn't a principled objection to doing it. It was simply, you know, there was a really serious problem in how they had chosen to go about doing it, which had caused this major backlog. Can I, can just, just for clarification, a PV check's historical. So you're looking, when, when somebody applies for a PV check, you're looking to see whether there's anything in their history that would prevent them from working with children. Not, not entirely, yeah, because there's, there's two aspects to the PVG scheme. The first thing is, well, there's actually three. So like this, the, the, the first one is that check that you refer to, you know, the, the looking back at a person's criminal record and seeing what's on there um, and, and representing that on the disclosure if there's anything. The second part is that the chief constable is given the um, opportunity to put on to the disclosure any information that the chief constable thinks is pertinent to working with that group, children or vulnerable adults. So that's also there. And the third part is the prospective part. So you've entered into the, you know, the, the disclosure process, but you've also signed up to being ongoing monitored, if you like. And so we upload 93 million records every month um, to match against our scheme membership to see whether or not there's new information coming up about that person. And if there is, just to answer a Mr. McKee's point earlier on, if there is new information that comes up on that person's scheme record, and it's of a sufficient degree of seriousness uh, to act, we will write to the organisations who that person works for and tell them that the person's under consideration for barring. So that's how that process works. It's uh, active monitoring. Well, I think the, the point I'm going to... The final? Final point. Quickly. The, the final point I was going to get to is, is that 
that, that I absolutely accept that that's that's the case. But surely part of the process should then be into child welfare and tra child child protection training should be part of the next stage of of a PVG uh, after, after a PVG. Sorry. Certainly, when we, sorry, what do you, uh, certainly when we've done our workshops um, and we do our, our visits to the regulatory, the, the registered bodies rather, a, our, our customer engagement team constantly talks about you know the purpose of PVG, not just the mechanics of PVG, why it's there. Do you know, so organisations are clear that you know we, we really talk about the duty to refer. For example, if somebody's barred, not barred rather, sacked from working with children. Or, or protected adults on one of the grounds of referral that's in the Act, they must be referred to us. So we, we, we do deal with that qualitative aspect around the purpose of the scheme and not just the, the mechanics of it. And I think as also in the PVG review, which is currently ongoing, we're really focusing in, laser focusing in, on trying to find you know the right messages and the right branding for PVG, the future of PVG, to capture entirely that aspect of why the scheme exists, not just that it's a a perfunctory step on the way to a job or, or a volunteering opportunity is actually something with a much more significant role. Very much. Can I just pick up on um, the issue that um, Ivan McKee was pursuing there? And with specific reference to the SYFA, are you comfortable that they did act appropriately um, when you informed them of people who were um, being listed or potentially listed? Um, and that it was simply an IT glitch in terms of pulling the data out? I think we are as far as we can be. I mean, as I said, we've sat down and made sure that they could identify all of those individuals. The responsibility to take action is very much upon them, um, but there's certainly nothing that we have come across in the past few months of working with them very closely suggests that there is a problem with that. It looks like it's been a, as, as Jared said, it looks like it's been an administrative problem and that they have been taking action. They just have not been able to then go in and identify that because of their IT systems. The other two things I wanted to ask about, um, it, it came to light that the SYFE look for um, birth certification as part of an identification. And I know that other organisations that I personally have volunteered with sometimes ask for different types of ID rather than the standard ID that um, is required for a PVG check. Are you aware of that being very common? Or, and, and I mean, I can see the obvious problem with that. You know, like for example, when I was volunteering myself, I went along to an evening to get checked and had the wrong kinds of ID that the organisation I was volunteering for wanted. Um, I had checked the PVG website. Do you think it would be useful in your PVG review to standardise that? I think we're actually um, really investing a lot of time and effort in that particular aspect. We're going to move to a digital platform. Mm -hmm. So in that digital platform, there will be a new way to verify ID within that process to make it much easier and much more straightforward the way that you would with, you know, banking or, you know, with, you know, your, you know those kinds of electronic commercial activities that we're all really used to now. So you're absolutely right. There's a confusion around that whole ID verification. And there's a good reason for it is to make sure you're matched with the right records. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's too much variation and we're going to fix that in the PVG review. Okay. And the other thing I wanted to ask about was this issue which um, keeps coming up um, and was certainly raised by an ex-chair of the SYFA which is being disclosed for multiple different organisations. So I was in that situation myself. I, for my job I was disclosed and I also had you know, a number of different uh, organisations that I volunteered for that I was PVG checked. Are we moving towards one single PVG check and everyone being able to access that register? So it's certainly one of the things that we're looking at. I mean, um, as part of the wider PVG review and also the, the future thinking about the organisation, how we operate, um, we are exploring a number of options to make it um, easier for the individual to access their records without endangering the safeguarding. So um, exactly how we will do that is something that we're still looking at, but we are aware of the, um, the challenges at the moment of having to get several scheme records for different people. So it's balancing the protection angle of it so that we don't miss anything with making sure that it's as streamlined as it can be for the individual. So it's always going to be a balance, but we're, we're looking at how we can improve that. Absolutely. I mean, the doers in a community are generally doing plenty. Yeah. <laughs> They're often involved in more than one organisation. The, the reason why we, it, it's, it's kind of necessary just now is that, is that by applying for a disclosure, an organisation puts their name against that person mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. if we come across new information uh, about that person's conduct, we then know 
that they're working for the scouts and for you know the boys brigade or whatever it might be to write to them so the, it registers an interest of, against that organization and that's why that's important so we need to find new ways to in the future achieve that outcome so yeah without, maybe a, a yeah. single register but multiple groups could be listed yes yes yeah thank you thanks very much okay Alison. thank you convener um, i just like a bit of clarity about you know when you became involved when it became apparent that the SYFA were experiencing difficulty because the committees heard previously that offers were made to assist them um, that were declined so I'd just like to understand what it is that alerts you to the fact that an organization isn't on top of, of this yeah. so we, we have um, we have a customer engagement team um, and we also monitor our volumes and we anticipate and profile our volumes so that we know that, for example, in a, a certain month that we're expecting from past behaviour, you know, a certain number of applications from certain quadrants. So putting that together with our customer engagement team's intelligence and, and tendrils they have out there, um, we became aware um, of the SYFA issue um, as a potential backlog. I think it came up through Volunteer Scotland. Um, I then wrote to them, and I think it was December or November, and said, have you got a problem? And we offered some assistance, uh, which was, a, I gave more detailed accounts of this to the previous mm -hmm. uh, committee. I can't remember the, the detail now, it's a bit foggy. But I wrote to them several times and offered assistance, uh, which wasn't taken up um, by uh, Mr Little, the, pre the, the previous <coughs> chief executive. So I think that, you know, then uh, there followed a process whereby, you know, the committee got involved and we had various discussions with them and then the help was put in to assist them but um, it would be through that process of our customer engagement team monitoring our volumes listening to what there's a lot of contact between ourselves and, and organizations and with volunteer scotland and other umbrella bodies and we just have good intelligence coming in that way assistance was declined were you surprised or concerned and did you do anything with that information at that point yes um, I, I, I escalated the, the matter um, and uh, and offered a uh, assertively uh, several times to you know to, to support the organization we liaise with volunteer Scotland I can't remember it was around the time of the first committee and um, so it very quickly came to committee and um, obviously uh, as a civil servant we made the government more generally aware of the issue and, and escalated within the, the government as well. So there was a very active response from Disclosure Scotland, as we would do in any situation where we perceived a child protection problem like that. OK, I mean, I think the committee have been aware through um, correspondence from previous officials of a, a system that seems to work. The PVG evening system. Um, I have a, a sort of picture in my head of, of, you know, a little hut or changing room and and forms being filled in in this manner. Is there a sort of model of best practice that you'd like to see in place? Do you make sure that organisations understand the expectations upon them? We've been doing increasing work around that, um, and we've been doing work not only with SYFA, but also with other bodies, and we're looking at doing an online training package. Um, we get round as many organisations as we can, but we recognise that we can't round, get round everybody. So we've been working with colleagues in Volunteer Scotland and others to say, what could we do to make something more readily available to people? Uh, so it's certainly something that we've, we've got in train at the moment. Can I ask one more question, Kavira? So what is it that's happening now um, with yourselves and the SYFA and SFA that wasn't happening before? I think it's collaboration, it's speaking to one another, and it's actually um, SYFA accepting help. Um, we, as, as Gerard had said, we have been trying to um, get in and help them for some time, but they're now actively engaging in that help. Uh, so it's been easy for us and our colleagues in Volunteer Scotland to um, set up additional meetings. And when we've had 13 training sessions um, around the country since the end of April and the start of the summer holidays. We've got another two happening today. Uh, so I think it's that willingness of SYFA and others to let us in and let us help. That's what has felt to me like it's made, it's made the difference. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, can I ask, in relation to uh, an organisation, if you have concerns about an organisation, you've raised it with them, uh, do you... And, and there's not any response, what happens next? Um, or there's not a satisfactory response? 
we don't have powers to go in and force people to act on our recommendations. If there are major issues around child protection, then there are a number of formal mechanisms which Gerard can talk you through. Um, but most of what we do is around offering help, trying to get people to listen, explaining why what we do is important. Um, but you, do you want to talk specifically about child protection concerns? Yeah, I mean, if there, if there are a particular child protection concerns, we would immediately um, escalate those through all the relevant channels. Um, we wouldn't sit on What are those channels? Eh? Well, if there was an immediate uh, child protection concern, that might be the police. You know, and we would, wouldn't hesitate to do that. And when we detect bad people trying to work with children or vulnerable adults, we immediately report them to the police. Um, so we take that very seriously. But that would be an indication of, you know, here's bad person A uh -huh. trying to work with these children. Yeah. Of course you would phone the police. That's just the of what anybody would do. Yeah. But here's a systematic breakdown. Mm -hmm. We've tried to deal with this organisation. They're not playing ball. Literally not playing ball in this mm -hmm. circumstance. And um, so how do we then escalate that yeah well our, our powers to audit an organization i under our terms of you know our codes and and, and the legislation relate mainly to the um to the ways in which the law is complied with in terms of the disclosure law there are very few powers as lorna said around you know the the softer stuff you know the the more qualitative aspects of performance however we wouldn't abdicate responsibility in that situation as we didn't with the SYFA we would use our customer engagement team to lean in you know to that organization to try and get as much intelligence as possible about what was going on we've got really good relationships with the umbrella bodies who, who volunteer Scotland are one of them but there are many other bodies who represent smaller entities you know, who use them to countersign disclosures. And they have a power relationship with those organisations, um, if you like, and, and we can use those levers to try and influence what's going on. Um, also, often there are other parallel parts of government which have got an interest in that part, you know, or that activity. For example, Active Scotland or Sports Scotland in respect of SYFA. Because we're part of government, we can link up with those parts of government and we did do that with the SYFA around Sports Scotland and Active Scotland. So there's a coordinated, it's about being switched on, it's about having your head up and looking at what the bigger picture is, as well as the particular powers that you might not have or have with regards to the organisation. But we certainly would always be assertive in leaning into these situations and would never allow, knowingly allow a situation where a safeguarding risk was built up or building up to, to persist without you know, continual escalation of that until we were satisfied it was being dealt with. Um, is this one of the most stark cases you've had of problems, or are there other cases where that you've had much worse? Well, no, I wouldn't say there's been cases where there's been worse. I mean, I think I think this is one of the ones where we were because it was a sort of a, 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 a part of this which wasn't visible. You know, a, the the backlog wasn't immediately visible to us. You know, I, and when it became apparent that there was a backlog, the, the magnitude of it was shocking to us, and we felt that that was a, a real, a, a real problem because of, there was a risk that those coaches could be exposed to to young people without necessarily having been checked. You know, and for that basis, on that basis, we took urgent, you know, action around that. There have been other, you know, we've just been through four years of bringing on the Scottish workforce onto the PVG scheme. A, and some of that was about, you know, people who were already in jobs, you know, already having been enhanced, disclosed, checked, you know, maybe some. Well, whenever PVG went live in 2011, there was a period of time within which we had to onboard into the scheme large numbers of public retrospective sector checks. retrospective checking. And so we did that in phases. So there was a there was a period of time whenever some organisations were doing better than others about getting those people on, but we managed that process and concluded it, you know, so that it's not entirely unprecedented that there's backlogs, but the fact that this was happening within the context of a rather hidden situation and in a very sensitive area like youth football coaching was a real concern to us. And you mentioned earlier the Scottish Rugby Union, they're working, is, are they working with you because they came to you uh, for assistance or were similar issues, backlog or systematic problems flagged up there? My understanding is they came to us for assistance. I mean, we had a meeting with, uh, ministers had a meeting um, around about the time of the, the last committee uh, with a number of um, bodies that oversee sports. Um, and I think the conversations with, um, with rugby football came out of that. Is, mm -hmm. So yeah. they, uh, is this them seeking assistance to get their systems 
up to scratch. Yeah. The, we've, we've been done. One of the things we did with the SYFA was that we, we did a series of roadshows following the, uh, the issues that happened. And we, we, that, those roadshows particularly focused on not just um, PVG checking, but also on training around safeguarding and trying to up that the ante with that. Other, our ambition is to do that with, with a wider body of sports organisations so that and we've got some agreement around the table that we can have that role so we're looking to roll that out in, in, in partnership with Sports Scotland and other organisations to try and offer that to other sporting bodies. So that, just to be clear I, I don't want the SRU tarred with anything that they haven't done but this this is not about protection or issue, uh, issues within that sport. It's about development. Thank you, thank you, that's helpful. In relation to the PGV review that's going on uh, um, What's your involvement in that, and when will it report, uh, and uh, how is the review going? Um, it's being led by our organisation, and particularly it's being led by Gerard and his team. Um, so there is a series of uh, steps in, in place, which um, I'll get Gerard to talk you through, but it's, it's basically owned by our organisation, and then um, we will bring recommendations to ministers in terms of future action. Yeah, um, the PVG review... Um, has been going on since uh, the end of last year. Um, Mr Swinney announced it in Parliament uh, following an inspired question and then spoke at a conference on the 21st of November 2016 at which he uh, announced the PVG review. The first phase was around um, setting up the um, terms of reference and those were published in February. Um, and uh, those terms of reference set out you know, a fairly wide virus for the review. It's, it's looking at a whole range of kind of fundamental aspects of the PVG scheme around whether the scheme should be either fully or partially mandated. You know, the, the nature of regulated work is part of that. The financial arrangements for the scheme and how it will, it will sustain itself in the future are part of that. Um, so it's, it's a very wide-ranging policy review of PVG and we've had a large number of events um, targeting a large number of organisations over the last um, few months of the review, um, and that will uh, that will lead to a formal consultation being published in the uh, late autumn, early well, probably about, about about December January period, and then a bill uh, will come forward uh, at some point um, in 2018, probably towards the end December 2018. Um, so that is the, the, the plan for the review, and the review is going very well. We've had enormous engagement from you know, a whole range of different organisations, including you know, a major charities concerned with child protection, child welfare, um, a employers, a organisations representing people with convictions. You know, so it's been the full gamut of, of interested parties have engaged with the review, so we're very hopeful that it's going to be a very useful um, exercise. And certainly there's been a lot of support for the scheme itself. I mean, people have different ideas about how it could be improved or whether it should be mandatory, but the principle that there should be a way of checking people who work with vulnerable children and vulnerable adults has definitely been accepted across the piece. Yeah. Maybe are looking at potentially mandatory. That's it's one of the areas that we're looking at. We're a long way from reaching a decision. Um, uh, and, no. and the... the um, consultation we've done so far there isn't a single view some people think it should be mandatory some people it should be mandatory in some areas so there isn't a single view but it's absolutely something that we'll be looking at and that issue around provisional membership as well will be considered as well the, do you mean in terms of the SYFA's yeah. behaviour yeah. well that isn't really a thing you know that, that, that the PVG has within it that's a, that's something the SYFA yeah, did would, would you not provide guidance in relation to that yeah. well we, we, we it's or comment. Because the scheme isn't mandatory, mm -hmm. um, it's impossible to say to an organisation that you must have a, a check done before you allow that person to be working with children of vulnerable adults. However, our advice would be... You probably just answered the question that we're probably all thinking of here. Yes. Our advice would be that that, that should be done. It's particularly where, obviously, where regulated work is, is, is being undertaken. Um, the review will look f fully at this and, and, and whether the scheme should be mandatory or not or the degree to which it should be mandatory is actually one of the things that's front and centre with our thinking in terms of this review. Thank you. Um, do you want to ask a final question? Miles, final um, question. Thank you and welcome uh, to today's meeting. Um, in the previous um, session, I'd asked Mr McCrimmon when he thought the system would be watertight and he, he said specifically, when we get there, when do you think they'll get there? given your expertise and, and looking at other organisations like this? Um, I wouldn't... There's nothing that would 
make me think they can't deliver on the timescales that they're working to. Um, I think what they need to do is carry on working with us and other bodies to make sure that they're looking at the full picture so that they are putting, as you say, child protection front and centre. Um, and I think if they continue to do that, I mean, certainly it feels, the relationship between us and them feels appreciably different than it did last time we were in front of the committee, and that in itself gives us hope that we will get to a place where um, we're in a much better position to make sure that they're providing the, the safeguarding checks that they should do. Okay, thank you. One final thing we missed was uh, in relation to agents, and uh, is it your view that they should be covered? It really depends on the work they're doing. Um, it's one of the issues with regulated work that one job title can mean a range of different things. So yeah. if they are actively supervising children that aren't being without other people being there, then yes, but different agents will do things in a different way. So it's hard to absolutely say in a job title, um, but um, people who are having unsupervised access to children, whatever they're doing, then yes. But you are considering that aspect. Definitely. Um, the, the, one of the options, the policy options that we've, that we've discussed with, um, with, with people who have been coming along to our events is if you were to make part of the scheme mandatory, you could specify certain roles which would be in the scheme, you know, uh, regardless. Uh, and obviously, uh, whether or not football agents would be would be something that would have to emerge from the review. But if you created the mechanism to have a scheme like that, then that would be one of the possible outcomes. But right now, they could be. Um, and I think it's also important to, to say to the committee that any, any one of us can join the PVG scheme um, under our own steam. But the, the difference is that if we don't have an employer who's offering us regulated work, what we get is a statement of scheme membership, which says that we're in the PVG scheme. It, it says whether or not we're under consideration for barring or not, but it doesn't give any mm -hmm. criminal history information. Now, people can use that. Students who are coming out who maybe want to offer the PVG scheme membership on their CV can join the PVG scheme. So that is not... The, being, being employed or having a countersigning employer such as to generate a disclosure isn't the only way to become a member of the PVG scheme. And when you do, you can be subject to ongoing monitoring. So football agents, if they wanted to, could join the PVG scheme, as could any of us. Thank you very much uh, for your evidence. Uh, and we'll now, uh, we'll now go into private session. Sorry.